friends, welcome to this 20th lecture in the NPTEL course titled Offshore Structures under Special Loads including Fire Resistance. In this lecture, we will try to converge some important design requirements in general and see how we can derive them intuitively depending upon our understanding of offshore structure behavior under conventional environmental loads and special loads whatever we have so far discussed. We already said that offshore structures are actually form dominated design out of which compliant structures are better for deep waters due to the reduction and displacement because of relative motion with respect to the fluid particles. Let us see some general design requirements which will be useful to understand the design of these structural embers under special loads. When you talk about general design requirements, one should really understand that these design requirements will be different for different classification of offshore structures. Let us talk about for fixed type structures. We understand that due to fixity, vertical displacement let us say deformation is designed to be lesser in case of fixed type structures we agree that depending upon the behavior we have realized that the vertical displacement will be far lesser compared to other kind of structures. Example could be a jacket platform, second could be gravity based platform etcetera. The second issue what we have here which we must remember when we converge to some design requirements is that they are highly rigid and therefore, tend to attract more forces. Therefore, the design criteria should be should be to actually limit the stresses in the members. So, the main issue here is to control the stress level in the members and not the member displacement or displacement of the system as a rigid body. So, we also have one important statement displacement of the platform or even to that extent of the members will be insignificant. So, the design criteria is to limit the stresses in the members. When we talk about compliant structures, we understand that these structures undergo large displacements, they are actually designed to undergo large displacements, because large displacements offer them compliancy 
and which in, the, in fact results in high degree of flexibility. Now, one can realize that when you improvise flexibility, the load carrying capacity may be reduced because of one fundamental reason. Flexible systems can fail also by buckling. Other than that, they can anyway fail in bending, shear, and torsion, and of course, axial forces. But in addition to that, they can also fail by buckling. Once I say larger displacements are allowed, I must also ensure that the system should have good recentering capability. It means the system should try to reach the equilibrium position at all instant of time under the given action of forces. The moment we agree that the system should have a good recentering capability, we are inducing either reversal of forces or displacements. In both ways, this may result in fatigue. So, complaint structures are forced to undergo, undergo cyclic stresses or reversal of displacements, which will result in fatigue. Keeping this in mind, flexible systems undergo large displacements under lateral loads. This may include conventional wind load, wave load loads arise from current, loads arise from impact and shock, load also arise from earthquake, load arise from ice etcetera. Large displacements of the structure now also induces disturbance in waves. So, some second order effects in wave action is also initiated which was absent in the case of fixed structures. Therefore, if we talk about the design criteria, the design criteria should be to control the displacement instead of limiting the stresses in members. The third issue which we must discuss in this case is orientation of the platform geometry with respect to the wave approach angle. Because we have seen that in the last lecture, a triangular platform in plan which may be or TLP compared to which we investigated a triangular TLP, we showed better performances on certain degrees of freedom. Depending upon the wave approach angle, how many members do you encounter the forces in the forward direction and how many in the aft direction and what is the spacing of the legs plays a very important role. So, orientation of the platform with respect to the wave approach angle is another important aspect in design including what should be the spacing of the legs. So, that 
when the wave passes through one leg attracts the crest and other becomes the trough therefore, the members cancel each other in terms of forces attracted by the lateral loads. So, then one may ask me a question what is the preferred orientation? The preferred orientation is members should have less projected area. on the encountered wave direction. So, one may ask me a question wave is approaching the platform in all directions. How can we design a platform to have less projected area only on a specific wave direction? If you look at the wave scatter diagram. And look at the windrows diagram. we will be able to find what we call predominant wave direction for a specific site. So, what we mean to say here is members should be designed in such a manner should be oriented in such a manner that they should have less projected area with respect to the predominant wave and wind direction. So, few data are required to design the platform depending upon the type of load acting on the platform. Land topographical survey of the chosen site. hydrographical survey of the chosen location silting details of the proposed site Windrose diagram indicating the predominant wind direction and wind velocity variations for a season in a year. cyclonic tracking data which indicates the wind velocity direction peak velocity period etcetera. We also need oceanographic data which includes the tidal data, wave data, current data, seabed characteristics, temperature, rainfall, etcetera. We should also have the seismicity level and values of ground acceleration in the last study we saw how we will be using the peak ground acceleration and the peak ground velocity for finding out the response of a complaint system in combination of distinctly high sea waves. We also need structural data of 
existing structures similar to the proposed one. We also require soil investigation report, etcetera. So, all these data are required to supply the input information for the designer Before we design, we need to find out the governing forces and the displacements and stress strain values in a given system. We need to anyway perform the analysis of the structure. Just for information sake, let us complete this discussion as well in this slide. You do analysis at different stages like execution, installation, in service stages during its lifetime. People generally use strict models that is beam elements associated in a frame. These are used for tubular structures. Example, jacket platforms, flare booms, lattice trusses to support the deck etcetera. Most importantly, one should assign local flexibility of the connections which is generally done by developing what we call as a joint stiffness matrix. We also need to assign geometrical and material characteristics for each member. We need to also assign hydrodynamic coefficients. like drag coefficient, inertia coefficient etcetera for the analysis. We need to assign data related to marine growth, because marine growth will also affect the roughness of the cylinder and thereby affecting the drag and inertia coefficients. We need to also carry out integrated analysis. of the deck and hull. This is very important in case of floating platforms. Especially in the case of structures like tricer or tops, since the base is isolated from the hull such integrated analysis becomes very important. One need to also examine the members for strength check.
where you relate the characteristic strength or characteristic resistance to yield strength of the material when the material of the member is undergoing cyclic stresses we should be able to use dynamic models of elasticity one should also perform stability check because compliance structures have a basic design requirement that the buoyancy exceeds the weight by a large amount therefore when the system remains afloat is it stable so stability should be ascertained by geometric design checking the center of buoyancy center of gravity etc one can ascertain by the geometric design whether the system is stable even when remains afloat in addition tubular joints are also checked for punching shear against various load patterns sometimes the welded connections need to be reinforced in the cord one common feature is one can use internal ring stiffeners so generally design requirements are check for two cases under normal operation under extreme operation normal operation is the plant is continuing to operate without shutdown whereas extreme condition is that the platform is endured over its lifetime there are various design factors available in international courts for example api rp 2a rp 2t which are giving various recommended design values design factors for various kinds of loads like axial bending etc one common design method which we will not touch in detail but very briefly limit state method there are various limit states to be governed by the design ultimate limit state this corresponds to an ultimate event considering the structural response after including some reserve strength the reserve strength comes from use of safety factor second could be fatigue limit state which relates to possibility of failure of the member under cyclic loading the third could be 
progressive limit state of collapse which we can call as PLS. This reflects the ability of the structure to resist collapse under accidental loads or collapse under abnormal conditions arising from sea states. The fourth one could be serviceability limit state which corresponds to the criteria for normal use or durability under normal operating conditions. Which will be specified by the platform operator. There are different varieties of loads under which these design criteria are governed by. We can say P permanent loads. The example could be structural weight, dry equipments, ballast etcetera. The other could be an L class load which we call as live loads which arise from storage personnel on board, liquid for ballasting etcetera. The next could be D class load which represents deformation loads which arise because of out of level supports. We will talk about these kind of loads especially in the next module where we discuss unsymmetrical bending, settlement effects etcetera. The next could be E class loads essentially come from environmental loads which include wave, current, earthquakes etcetera. The last one is an A class load which comes from accidental loads which can cause can result from dropped objects, ship impact, blasting, fire, explosion etcetera. If you consider quickly the various limit states and various load categories, let us say P class, L class, D, E and accident classes all will have different levels of probability of occurrence and significance of these loads causing consequences on the structure are different. Therefore, different factors will represent these varieties of loads in a given system. If you talk about ultimate limit state under normal conditions, then we say that these factors could be 1.3 for P and L class load, 1 for deformation class, 0.7 for environmental loads and do not consider 
accident loads because in under normal operating conditions. When we talk about ultimate limit state under extreme conditions, then we do not multiply the P in n class load by a factor simply say 1 only, but we enhance the environmental loads because extreme condition arise because of this. So, the extreme C state distinctly I C waves will all come under this classification. Still in this case, we do not consider shock and impact loads. When we talk about fatigue limit state, we only consider environmental loads in this case as a factor and no other forces are considered for this as a multiplying factor. If you talk about progressive limit state, which is caused because of accidental, then we include the presence of all the loads without any enhancement, including the accidental loads. When we talk about progressive limit state of post damage analysis, then we consider all the loads but we do not consider the accidental load. If we talk about SLS service limit state, we consider all the loads present in the system uh, without accidental load. So, friends please note that in most of the limit states in design, we generally do not include the accident case and the multiplying factor in most of the cases remains unity. It means it is understood that all these varieties of loads like permanent, live load, deformation and environmental loads act with the same amount of probability which is a very important level of complexity in analysis and design of offshore platforms. These are about the factors for the loads. We also use factor for material strength. because the characteristic definition applies to both material and the loads. Loads we already saw in different variety in the last slide. Material strength generally for ultimate limit state we use 1.15 and for progressive limit state and service limit state we use 1.00 as the material strength factor when we use steel as a material for construction. When we talk about various limit state in terms of constructability, we can again divide the loading and the design criteria. Let us say P class, L class, E class, D and accident class. We talk about different conditions where we do analysis. Let us say for construction condition, we use P class and we do generally ultimate limit state and serviceability limit state. For load out which is one of the important segment in construction process, we include permanent loads and live load and live load. We use reduced wind. In this case, we use or we consider displacement of support. and we do not consider accident, then we do ultimate limit state. During transporting, we consider P class and N class loads. We also consider environmental loads during transport. We do not consider support displacement and accidental loads, we do ultimate limit state. During launching, 
we consider p class and l class loads and we do ultimate limit state during lifting operation we consider p class and we do ultimate limit state during earthquake analysis we do p class l class loads we consider wind and wave action with a specific return period as specified by the codes support displacement whatever happens actually will be considered no accidental loads when we talk about damage structure in earthquake analysis we consider permanent load and live load we consider earthquake load with return period of 10 power minus 2 and we do ultimate limit state in case of damage structure we want to do analysis for reliability condition we do consider permanent load and live load we consider reduced wind and wave we do not consider support settlement and accidental loads we generally do progressive limit state of these things so friends interestingly different limit states are also applied at different stages of construction as well you also in fact attract more loads during fabrication and installation the loads arise during fabrication and installation are temporary there are different varieties of international codes which give you idea about these kind of loads to be considered in the analysis dnv rules are one such provisions they define the return period for considering the environmental conditions for the design the other one is api rp 2a the third one could be bs 6235 which recommends a minimum recurrence interval of 10 years of the design environmental loads in addition we will also have forces arising because of lifting they depend on the structural configuration number and location of the lifting i i should say i's because there can be many locations angle between the sling and vertical axis we will also talk about the stresses generated in the crane hooks because of lifting forces in the next module conditions prevailing during lifting I am talking about the environmental conditions. Generally, to account for all these second order effects, a factor of 2 is applied. 
two members and a factor of 1.35 is applied to the secondary members. So, I should say here primary members and of course, connections. When you do load out in sheltered locations, there is an advantage sheltered locations will have some control on environmental factors. Therefore, the load factors used under sheltered condition is 1.5 and 1.15 respectively as in the case of previous considerations. In addition, we also have forces which arise from transportation or during transportation. These are the forces generated when the platform components like let us say jacket legs, deck of the platform are transported. Usually we agree and understand that transportation happens from offshore on the barges. Sometimes they can be even self floating. So, we can have dry or wet flotation. So, APA RP 2 A interestingly gives you lot of guidelines for forces to be considered during transportation. One should consider weather window during transportation, appropriate return period of wind and wave during transportation window. One should also think about the size of the barge, its sensitivity and most importantly the cost. So, these factors will govern the kind of transportation forces that can be included in the analysis. Forces also arise because of launching and appending when you launch a platform from the barge additional forces will be generated while you are appending the platform. To its vertical position, it is interesting that additional forces, in fact I should say additional stresses will be generated. So, friends interestingly when a member is oriented only be a small tilt of few degrees, let us say 1 or 2 degrees, the stress increment in the member can be as high 
as about 40 percent because that will create additional moment on the members which will result because of unsymmetrical bending caused on these members which we will discuss in detail with some examples in the next module. Lastly, there can be accidental loads which arise during installation commissioning of offshore platforms. Most importantly all accidental loads that arise during this operation are very ill defined because they have very serious variations in probability of occurrence. Accident loads can happen due to collision of vessels. It can also happen because of unintended flooding of buoyancy tanks. They have different probability of occurrence and consequences. Therefore, one cannot really define in a proper manner what could be the intensity of accident loads on the design. But accidental loads can be disregarded if its annual probability of occurrence is less than 10 power minus 4 this as per DNB rules. The reason is the estimate of consequence for this kind of occurrence is very difficult. Only when the occurrence exceeds this probability then one can have data related to their consequences therefore, some intensity of these loads can be included in the design. Otherwise, they are generally ignored. However, accidents do occur because of construction and erection stages in offshore platforms. So, friends in this lecture, we converse certain basic design rules, understood varieties of additional forces which occur because of constructability and transporting, lifting etcetera in offshore platforms. We also realized what could be the governing guidelines for design of compliant and fixed type platforms under classical types of loads may be regular or normal may be extreme conditions like special loads. Thank you very much.